Welcome everyone to today's webinar. Um, really appreciate you being here to explore visioning a resilient future, the role of farmland protection in reaching Maine's climate goals. Um, this has been an incredible collaborative effort working alongside Maine Farmland Trust and American Farmland Trust. So I wanna thank them. Thank you all for being here. I'm really excited uh, to have the opportunity to moderate and facilitate this discussion alongside Senator Craig Hickman, Commissioner Amanda Beal, uh, Chelsea Gazillo and Shelley McGuire to talk about farmland protection. And so um, really appreciate you all being here. Just a quick logistic uh, item as this is a, a webinar, um, we're gonna use the Q and A function in the chat. So there will be opportunity to ask questions and we'll save them for later. And we'll, we'll get to as many as we can and we'll try to consolidate them. Um, so when you actually vote, you can actually click like, and that will kind of elevate if you agree um, or want to kind of highlight that question for us to ask. So we'll do our best. Um, it's going to be a great discussion. And with that, um, we'll get going. I'm Matt Cannon. He, him, I live in Portland. I'm the State Conservation and Energy Director for Sierra Club, Maine. Um, and as part of Sierra Club, our broader conservation vision is to safeguard and restore nature's invaluable gifts by securing permanent protection for at least 30% of lands and waters by 2030. This is also uh, known as the 30 by 30 campaign, if you've heard that. Um, and so through Sierra Club, um, we believe achieving this ambitious goal will be essential to protecting the biodiversity of our world, minimizing climate change, and preserving equitable access to nature for all communities um, for future generations. So this goal is aligned with the national 30 by 30 goal, um, which you may have heard about in different forms. American Farmland Trust also works on that goal nationally. Um, but I just wanna highlight at the beginning, those are national goals um, relating to the national 30 by 30 campaign. This, a lot of this discussion today around state goals is not the same thing. So I just don't wanna conflate the two. We're working on a national campaign that's similar, um, but the state's goals as they relate to 2030 are not uh, affiliated with that. Um, and at Sierra Club, our main focus is actually larger than the 30 by 30. We're kind of looking what would 50 by 50 look like and beyond. And how do we envision uh, interacting with each other and the planet for generations to come most equitably? And we're particularly focused on how to engage frontline and BIPOC communities in co-creating our shared future together. So alongside our volunteer team, our national campaign, and specifically my colleague, Nilat, who I'm going to shout out, um, we began listening and conducting a needs assessment with BIPOC communities and the next phase of our work is public engagement around intersectionalities and how does this broader goal interact with land use and transportation and housing. Um, and so that's what we're focused on as part of this broader public education effort. And so in addition to this webinar, we're excited uh, to host a podcast series called Redefining Conservation, which is coming soon. So stay tuned. And so without further ado, that was just to give you some context. Today, we're joined by American Farmland Trust, Maine Farmland Trust, Senator Craig Hickman, and Commissioner Amanda Beal to provide a broad-based overview of how Maine's farmland can play a critical role in these efforts. So this includes perspectives on how the state can increase farmland access opportunities to keep Maine's farmland in agriculture, it also will critically focus on creating equitable opportunities for Maine's historically marginalized producers. Uh, and we'll also try to frame this conversation regionally, looking more closely at uh, the broader New England goal of growing 30% of our food by 2030. So after this webinar, I hope you all will have a better understanding of farmland protection in Maine and the region and how we can start prioritizing it in policy uh, specifically as Maine looks to its next climate action plan that will be drafted in the coming months. So I'm going to introduce Shelley McGuire first. 
who's policy and research director at Maine Farmland Trust. She manages their federal, state, and municipal policy work and oversees the design, completion, and dissemination of its research work. She brings to her role as policy and research director a deep commitment to using solid evidence and compelling storytelling to inspire lasting political change. Um, Shelley, take it away. Thank you so much, Matt. So I'm really glad to be here today. Thank you to all the participants who were able to join and thank you to each of my co-presenters. I'm really looking forward to this important conversation. So as Matt said, I'm Shelley McGuire. I work for Maine Farmland Trust or MFT. I see a lot of familiar names in the participant list, but for those who might not be familiar with Maine Farmland Trust, we are a member-powered nonprofit organization that works to protect farmland, support farmers, and advance the future of farming in the state. Our goal is to protect Maine farmland and to help farmers and communities throughout the state thrive. I'll be presenting today on why farmland protection matters in Maine and why local food matters and why both are critical as we prepare the state and its residents for the worst impacts of climate change. And as we make meaningful, um, meaningful reductions at the same time in reducing our state's carbon footprint. I'll also share some thoughts on how we're doing overall in protecting Maine's agricultural resources and what's needed as we look to the future. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Take just a sec for me to get set up. All right. And hopefully you all are seeing a beautiful picture now. <laughs> all right. So jumping right in, I want to talk a little bit about Maine Won't Wait. So Maine's Climate Action Plan, Maine Won't Wait, sets the goal of conserving 30% of Maine's land and waters by 2030. Protecting our working lands, including the state's farmland, is really critical to achieving this goal. According to the final report of the Land Conservation Task Force, which was completed in 2019, Maine has conserved about 20% of its land, or roughly 4.2 million acres. Working farmland makes up a small but critical portion of conserved land. American Farmland Trust's Farms Under Threat report from around that same time period, just a few years ago, estimates that just over 54,000 acres of Maine's working farmland have been protected to date, meaning that of Maine's total conserved land, only a super tiny fraction is working farmland. When I did the math out, I got 1.3%. So of all of our conserved land, only 1.3% is working farmland. At MFT, and I think the sentiment is shared by others on the call as well, we would argue that there's a real opportunity to expand working farmland protection and to accelerate progress towards Maine's climate goals. Demand for easements is huge and it far outpaces available resources. So why does protecting farmland matter? And specifically, what is the link to climate? Protecting farmland in Maine is essential for ensuring that we have the land base to grow our agricultural economy, particularly as more farmers reach retirement age and development pressures increase across the state. There's a broad range of participants on this call. So I'll just like real quick, do a quick explanation of what we mean when we say farmland protection and how agricultural easements work. So an agricultural easement is a type of a conservation easement. It's a voluntary legal agreement that is gone into it between a private party and another, and it permanently protects the land by restricting um, by restricting it for either like open space, recreation, wildlife habitat, or in the the case of an agricultural conservation easement for agricultural production. So an agricultural easement is written with farm use as the top priority. An easement keeps the land in private ownership 
and available for agriculture by permanently restricting um, future development. So by permanently altering the deed to prevent, for example, subdivision or to limit construction unless for agricultural use to directly support the farm. Protecting Maine's farmland in this way really guarantees that it can be available for current and future agricultural use. Why this is important is because Maine's farmland is a precious and a limited resource. According to the last um, U.S. Department of Ag Census of Agriculture report, between 2012 and 2017, Maine lost 10% of its farmland. That's over 1,000, um, sorry, 145,000 acres of pasture land, cropland, and woodland lost. And the loss, of, the loss of farmland is troubling because farms provide many critical ecological, economic, and community benefits to our state. Protecting Maine's farmland is necessary to ensure that we have enough land to grow our agricultural future. Um, and it's also really critical to making sure that those who want to contribute to feeding our communities are able to access the land that they need in order to do so. So that brings me to access. Farmland protection can also be a tool that improves access, but it's only one component of a broader set of strategies. One of the things that we're focusing on at MFT as an institution as we evolve is farmland access. And we want to ensure that a concerted effort is made to include members of the agricultural community who can't afford or don't want to own land or take part in the mortgage system or who have been discriminated against uh, through either property law, ownership systems, or other forms of discrimination. And as Maine advances its conservation goals, I really call on decision makers to advance conservation in a way that is inclusive of all those wanting to take part in our food system, whether it be for commercial agriculture or whether it be for subsistence or community-based production, traditional foodways, medicines, and more. So if you leave with nothing else today, then let it be sort of a belief in the validity of the statement here that farmland protection is climate action. As a natural resource-based industry, agriculture requires productive land, good soils, good water. We have a lot of these things in Maine. Um, in turn, farmers and the land that they steward provide a variety of environmental and climate benefits um, in Maine. Maine farms often consist of a mixture of cultivated fields, pasture, woodlands, um, and wetlands. And these lands act collectively as a natural filter for drinking water. They provide important aquifer recharge areas. They help to minimize flooding. They provide habitat for a variety of animals. As I'm listing out these like ecosystem services, I'm sure a lot of you are thinking about the climate change effects that we're already seeing in Maine. One of which is like sort of the, these periods of drought and then followed by periods of extreme rain and flooding. So think about the way that those ecosystem services and natural benefits from farms also help our broader communities and across our state. Ensuring that farmland stays in farming is also a key natural climate solution. So undeveloped agricultural land and farmers use of healthy soils practices like cover cropping, reduced tillage, many practices that are used and popular across the, the breadth of Maine agriculture, help to mitigate the impacts of climate change by sequestering carbon and limiting greenhouse gas emissions. In fact, a 2020 study from the University of Maine found that by increasing the use of climate smart agricultural practices, Maine farms have the potential to sequester enough carbon to offset all of the greenhouse gas emissions that they produce with, and more, which is very exciting. In recognition of these climate benefits, Maine Won't Wait, our current climate action plan, establishes the goal of increasing both the amount of Maine produced food that is consumed within the state, as well as the total amount of farmland conserved statewide. 
As many of you probably know, the Maine Climate Council has recently kickstarted the process of developing the state's next climate action plan, the successor framework to Maine Won't Wait. As part of the next climate action plan, I call on decision makers to set ambitious targets for expanding farmland protection efforts in the state as well as to determine specific investments that are needed in order to make um, substantial increases to the amount of Maine produced food that is available for consumption locally. So this brings me to how are we doing so far? There is much more farmland in Maine that needs permanent protection so that it can stay as working farmland. But I do want to emphasize that every agricultural easement matters, and we are making progress. Um, a quick story, because I just can't help myself, and I believe in the power of storytelling. I want to share the story of how impactful agricultural easements can be. So this picture here is of an MFT staff member on the left, April Costa, and then Judy Loro of landowner on the right. And this is from my hometown of Hamden. As many of you know, Hamden is just outside of Bangor. It's um, sort of a bedroom community of Bangor. It's uh, faced a lot of development pressure over the last several decades as Bangor has grown. Um, and it used to include a lot of farmland. Uh, the number of dairy farms on my bus route when I was going to school growing up are more than I can count. Um, and now it's a lot of subdivisions. Uh, Judy Loro, pictured here, um, was very committed to protecting the Patterson farm in Hamden, her family's farm. After her husband passed away, she felt strongly before she sold the land that it uh, she fulfill a longtime dream of her husband and keep the land in farming. Maine Farmland Trust, using private resources, placed an easement on the farm, and Judy was able to sell the farm to her, her neighbors, the Domina family, who would likely not have been able to access that property without the easement on it. They plan to start a farm on the property. They'll continue to lease part of the land for hay, and then they're starting up their own farm business. Um, and they'll be doing both an educational agriculture, sort of like an agritourism mixed with an educational component, as well as establishing a market garden. And in the coming years, they aspire to be the first farmers from the city of Hamden that are actually um, providing food locally grown at the Hamden Farmers Market. So that's something that's just really inspiring to me as I think about why this work matters in towns across the state. That to say, much of the farmland conservation in Maine has been done through the support of private philanthropy, like the Patterson Farm Story. Farmland protection efforts through the Land for Maine's Future program and the recently fo formed Working Farmland Access and Protection program um, within the Bureau of Ag agriculture, which Commissioner Beal will talk about in more detail, also form really important pieces of the, the puzzle. Uh, nearly 10,000 acres of farmland have been protected through the Land for Maine's Future program since, since its inception in 1987. And it's a really important source of public funding for Maine's forests, farmland, and working waterfronts. But I want to emphasize that in comparison to the rest of the Northeast United States, Maine is really lagging behind in terms of the number of farms protected by conservation easements and then the acreage, the acreage of farmland protected. Uh, using GIS analysis, Maine Farmland Trust staff recently estimated that 3.6% of Maine's open farmland has been permanently protected to date. For the sake of comparison, as much as, as a native Mainer, I know how much Mainers hate being compared to other New England states. I will just say that Massachusetts has protected over 21% of its farmland, Connecticut 17%, and Vermont 15%. So we are lagging behind and we really call for public investment in farmland protection that reflects our shared values and the value that a lot of Mainers have um, 
when it comes to our farmland. So why are we behind? The, the reason or one of the reasons that we're lagging behind is just the lack of public investment in farmland protection. As you can see from this chart, there are discrepancies between the state funding that has been spent in Maine. Uh, you'll see us at the bottom there in red, 12.5 million, and then the amount of state funding that's been spent in, in other states in, in the Northeast or on the East Coast. It's clear to me when looking at this data that we need to rapidly expand our farmland protection efforts in the state, especially publicly funded farmland protection efforts. This will help to stave off development pressures and ensure that farmers can continue to access the land that they need for agricultural production. So we are so grateful for the work that is ongoing um, by the state, by all the organizations that are on this call. And I also call on decision makers to continue to explore solutions that will best work for Maine, to think about how to generate robust public revenue for farmland protection and for access efforts that are targeted towards the communities that need access the most, and to make sure that we do what we need to do as a state to ensure that we enhance our food security, our equity in access to Maine's natural resources, and move towards climate action. So thank you so much, Matt and others. Hopefully I didn't go too far over time. And I'll pass it back to you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Shelley. Um, really appreciate that, especially highlighting those local stories, which are so important. Um, and even just seeing our investment compared to other states, that was um, pretty stark contrast. Um, I have not seen that before. Uh, and just before I introduce our next speaker, I'd like to just remind folks, we do have opportunity to ask questions through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can ask as we move along and we'll do our best to consolidate after all the presentations uh, and there'll be a little time at the end. So our next speaker is Commissioner Amanda Beal, who served as Commissioner of the Maine Department of Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry since 2019. DACF is charged with promoting and advancing Maine's agricultural resources, protecting and enhancing nearly 18 million acres of forest land, managing more than 700,000 acres of state parks and public lands, and administering numerous science-based programs focused on resource management, land use planning, and conservation. Commissioner Beal serves as a Maine Climate Council member and co-chairs the Council's Natural and Working Lands Working Group, she also currently serves on the executive committee of the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture as president of the Northeast Association of State Departments of Agriculture. I think I got that right. Um, thank you so much, Commissioner Beal, for being here. Take it away. Yes, thank you. Yes, you did get that right. I'm on the executive committee for NASDA and I'm serving as the president of the regional uh, subcommittee for organization called NASDA. Um, it's really wonderful to be here today. This is such an important topic, and I'm so uh, grateful to be invited to, to speak with you all um, and share just some of what's going on at the state level. And uh, as Shelley mentioned, you know, we, we're operating now from a main climate action plan called Maine Won't Wait that we are getting ready to start start updating, but I just want to wind it back a little bit and say that, you know, I was really excited to um, come on board with the Governor Mills administration, particularly as right at the beginning of her first term in office, she put forth the, you know, the she really set our state's efforts to build climate resilience as we work toward the goal of decreasing greenhouse gas emissions by 45% by 2030 and 80% by 2050 and achieving carbon neutrality by 2045 through a whole suite of strategies. And what that did in 2019 is that kicked off a really robust uh, process with lots of engagement um, through the Maine Climate Council, through numerous working groups, through uh, numerous subcommittees over months and months and months, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, more like thousands and thousands of hours, went into this effort really bringing a lot of folks with expertise in different areas together to make sure that we had a plan that could really meet this charge. 
Uh, and so I, I've been serving on the Climate Council since then. Uh, and as uh, was mentioned before, I've been co-chairing the Natural and Working Lands Group. Uh, it's been a great honor and I'm really excited about the progress we've made, but I'm even more excited about the progress that we will make uh, in the coming years. So uh, why this was exciting to me, as you can imagine, climate change impacts everything about our work and everything that our work at DACF touches um, as a state agency, agriculture, forestry, state parks, public lands, and, and more. And I, I will never forget the early on in my tenure, I actually went to a park manager's meeting and uh, was talking about some of the things that were going to be important to us in the, in the coming years and that I, I was excited to work on. And I spoke about climate change. And one of our park managers raised his hand and said that it was really refreshing to hear me speaking about climate change as an urgent matter because, you know, on the ground as someone who really cares about the land resources and, you know, where they, what they steward, uh, it's really hard on morale to not have the right tools uh, and resources to deal with the impacts. And that's really stuck with me all these years. And it just motivates me to stay really deeply engaged in this work through my role as commissioner. So um, as was stated, the, uh, the Natural Working Lands Group is a working group of the Climate Council. And um, so we were uh, fortunate to have the opportunity to put forth, I think, some really meaningful recommendations for the first climate action plan. And, um, and since then, actually, I've co-chaired a number of different task forces and advisory discussions as we have worked on, you know, how we implement the climate action plan and, you know, looking for opportunities to further explore the potential for carbon sequestration and storage in forests and our soils and, uh, and just having a number of other deep dive conversations that really help us to figure out how to implement uh, those goals. So, that, so there are two goals that are really important, I think, to the discussion today, uh, and Shelley touched on them, but I'm just going to go into a little bit more depth. Uh, well, I'll touch on them now, I'll go into more depth in a little bit, but the two goals are uh, conserving 30% of our state's natural and working lands. And I just wanted to, to touch back on what you said, Matt. Um, the reason we are not uh, referring to it as 30 by 30, 30 is that I think we came to that number a little bit by coincidence. Um, and then when the initiatives, the 30 by 30 initiative, both at the you know federal level and at the international level started really coming out into the, the light. And um, we, we understood that what we had really been talking about, probably a limitation of us being the natural and working lands working group, uh, did not include uh, ocean or marine spaces. And so that 30% goal is really just a land-based goal. And so we're trying not to confuse folks by calling it that, uh, even though I think in spirit, we're all wanting to do really similar things here. And maybe as the Natural and Working Lands Group reconvenes, that's something we can go back and take a look at. Um, but I also, uh, the other goal to look at is the um, idea that we could be consuming, or 30% of the food that we consume here in Maine could be grown here. And that really relates to our, you know, climate resilience and uh, climate impacts because everybody eats. And historically, we have imported uh, a large percentage of our food in the last number of decades. And that is something that does not give us the ability to really control our carbon footprint, our emissions footprint. And by thinking about how we can grow more of the food that we consume in our state, uh, it gives us an opportunity to work on that and to um, really be promoting the types of practices that we think are going to be most climate friendly and uh, just really have more of a more of a hand in that. And it presents a number of other opportunities as well. That 30% goal does also track with uh, the New England Food Vision goal, if you're familiar with that. Uh, that was a report that came out Oh, I'm going to say almost 10 years ago, which really dates me <laughs> because I had the honor of working on that report uh, as, as a team of writers and researchers back then. And it doesn't seem like it's been that long, but anyway. Um, but yeah, so I, I'll talk about a few other um, things that we've been doing uh, along the way. Um, as Shelley mentioned, um, we've really been looking at making some improvements to processes that guide 
farmland protection um, for our primary state funded program, Land for Maine's Future. And um, that program supports conservation of natural and working lands uh, as well. And uh, Shelley's right, you know, since 1987, uh, that program has protected uh, nearly 10,000 acres uh, of farmland, but that's that's not keeping pace with what we know uh, is a result of the development pressure in the farmland that we've been losing. And I will just say, as someone who's traveled all over the state of Maine, there is development pressure for farmland everywhere. It's not just in and around the urban areas or, sub or suburban areas. In it, we are even seeing development pressure and loss of farmland in some of our most rural communities. So this is something that we definitely need to take really seriously and uh, and keep working on. And, and I just will say too, uh, you know, as a shout out to Maine Farmland Trust, um, you know, the work that that organization is doing is obviously very, very important, um, as well as, you know, local land trusts and others who are trying to make sure that farms in their communities are there for uh, community members of the future. So um, one of the things that we did uh, in terms of improving the process around LMFs farmland protection uh, activities is that we we actually formalized, created a more formalized working farmland access and protection program. And so that is um, really a partnership between our Bureau of Agriculture and LMF. And we have recruited a panel of experts who now uh, do sort of the deep dive evaluation into farmland protection projects that are being proposed. And then they make a recommendation to the LMF board, to the LMF board for funding. And that, that seems to be going well. It's still relatively new, but it, it seems to be um, a good uh, tweaking of that process. And in 2021, uh, our governor actually included a general fund appropriation in her budget to allocate $40 million to the LMF program uh, through, through the general fund. Uh, historically, funding has come to LMF uh, through bonding. And but uh, there was just such strong support for this idea, and our legislature. Thank you, Senator Hickman. I know you you've been such a strong supporter of this program. Uh, approved that allocation, and I I also serve on our state's LMF board, and can report that since that allocation was made, uh, about twenty eight and a half million of those funds have been committed or spent on conservation projects, and of that, about one point six million dollars. Uh, is for farmland protection projects. Um, and so we we still have a ways to go there as well, but we're really excited to keep working on that front. So just jumping back to the 30% goals for conservation and consumption of Maine grown foods, food in, in the state of Maine. So I just wanna paint this picture as we talk about protecting 30% of our natural working lands. So our state um, is, you know, largely forested, about 89% forested, and there is absolutely a stated desire for all the reasons you can imagine to keep forests as forests. And this includes working forests, uh, where we do see the benefits of moving toward more wood-based products and having those take the place of other materials that may have a higher emissions profile. So we're very fortunate to be rich in that natural resource in our state. It really does give us some options. Through the pandemic, we all saw the pressure on our recreational lands and uh, really came out the other side, understanding that we need to expand options for people to recreate and uh, enjoy the outdoors, uh, while we're also providing important intact habitats to support plant and animal species health and biodiversity. Um, and meanwhile, the pandemic only reinforced the need uh, for that 30% percent food consumption goal as being a state at the end of the transportation line in a number of ways meant some very sobering market disruptions. And so we know uh, now on the other side of that, and some of us knew this beforehand, but <laughs> more of us know it now, that really to build our own food resilience as a state, um, which includes addressing processing bottlenecks, it also gives us the opportunity to support practices, as I said earlier, that are climate friendly and to mitigate our own carbon footprint when it comes to the food cycle. And we are also, of course, seeing an increase in activity with renewable energy development, which is also important to meet our overarching goals, but um, also comes with its own land use needs. So I'm 
personally really passionate and excited about meeting all of these goals, but I think it's clear that we're going to have to talk more and more specifically about land use and some of the trade-offs we need to make as we navigate with a more holistic viewpoint. So to that end, uh, I'm excited that we're going to be reconvening or starting to meet uh, a bit more often. Uh, we have met over the past few years as the Natural Working Lands Working Group, but we'll be convening again regularly this fall. And I think these are the kinds of things that we're gonna have to dig into and um, have those deeper uh, conversations about conservation and food consumption goals, which I see as very compatible um, and you know that this will just be a good venue for us to, to dig in a little deeper. And so we're just about to launch that work. Um, it will be a public process. People can uh, listen in, come to meetings. Um, we will have opportunities for the public to give their input along the way and just really wanna encourage that participation. That is what is going to ensure that we have um, really good, really relevant updated goals for me and coming out the other side. A um, couple of things, just I think I'm aware of time and I might be going over here. Um, so I think I'm going to skip a couple of things and I can just talk about it if they come up in uh, in the Q&A. Uh, I did want to just mention that we're, we're also excited alongside our goals that have come out of the, the climate action process or climate action plan uh, discussions. Uh, we're, we're very excited about some of the work that's happening in conjunction uh, throughout New England, uh, the New England Feeding New England Project, which is a project of the New England State Food System Planners Partnership, recently re released a document called A Regional Report to Food System Resilience. And um, it really digs into how New England as a region might actualize the New England food vision. And uh, so that's exciting. And also they're undertaking a process by which they're trying to really establish a universal, well, with universal methodology, a baseline for each of the New England states as to how much food we are consuming that's produced within our states. There's been this number out there for a long time that's been sort of a catch-all, which is that, you know, we consume 10% of the food in our state, we import 90%. But I think that uh, definitely could use a refresh. And so very excited that they're taking that on. Um, and then also uh, ongoing and supporting efforts by other regional entities like Food Solutions New England, NISOG, you know, AFT, and others uh, really are helping to keep the momentum going on this front. So I think the, the punchline is I agree with Shelley completely. We, we really need to better understand you know, how we can make uh, more progress and faster progress on protecting our farmland. Um, our best farmland soils are a finite resource. Uh, once they're gone, developed on, I mean, you know, it, <laughs> I think you, you can see the writing on the wall. But anyway, um, really excited to be here. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you, Commissioner. Really appreciate that. Um, and look forward to the Climate Council process. Um, our next speaker is Senator Greg Hickman. Senator Hickman is serving his second term representing Senate District 14, which includes 12 municipalities in the Southern Kennebec County. He's the first black lawmaker in Maine history to serve in both the House and the Senate. He is a Harvard graduate and a local business owner running a successful organic farm and a bed and breakfast with his husband. Senator Hickman fights for measures that promote food sovereignty, protect individual rights and civil liberties, combat poverty and hunger, and support rural economic development. Senator Hickman's father was a World War II veteran and Tuskegee Airman. Both of his parents were involved heavily in the civil rights movement, teaching him by example about the importance of public service and community. Currently, Senator Hickman serves as the Senate Chair of the Government Oversight Committee, and the Senate Chair of the Veterans and Legal Affairs Committee, and also serves as a member of the Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry Committee. Um, take it away, Senator Hickman. Thanks for being here. Uh, thank you for having me. I literally just lost my screen. Uh, pardon me. Um, I want to say that as an organic farmer <clears throat> here in Central Maine, Pardon my voice, I have been recovering, or maybe not recovering, battling an upper respiratory infection that has no name, um, but has absolutely 
sort of wreaked havoc in my ability to be as prepared as I would like to be uh, for today's presentation. It's always good to hear from Commissioner Bill about the work of the Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. And as an organic farmer here in Central Maine, I can say climate change is real. I've been farming for 15 seasons, and this was a season like no other. Unpredictable in every way, strange, quirky, between the wind and the rain and the pests and wildlife. We suffered on our small organic farm here on Annabeth's Cook Lake and went for about 80% crop loss. And even for a small scale farm such as mine, um, that is a tremendous loss of revenue. But more than that, it is a diminishing of the food um, that we feed our community with. And so um, I say that a little bit in sorrow, but I'm happy that we are having this discussion about farmland conservation. Um, I wasn't sure what I exactly was going to do. What I, what I am going to do is read a few quotes to bring the people to the conversation that are not always heard. And the quotes that I'm bringing to the conversation are from a very, a, a first ever report that was uh, directed by the legislature for the permanent commission on the status of racial indigenous and tribal populations working in conjunction with the Department of Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry to come up with a report called Land Access for Indigenous and African-American Farmers in Maine. I think that in our, in the past few years, we have certainly looked at a racial reckoning of some kind. We have our first Secretary of Agriculture who's an indigenous woman. We under President Obama and now under President Biden, we are trying to correct some historical wrongs for Black farmers across the country. And this report was, uh, there were a lot of people interviewed for this report. Uh, you can find it online actually under the uh, committee materials from the 130th legislature of the Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry Committee. It is about 26 pages long. I certainly cannot read the whole thing in my time, but really all I wanna do is read some of the quotes that the people gave to the interviewers and then sort of close with a little bit of what we're trying to do in Maine um, through the work. Um, one of the things about land access for indigenous and tribal populations and, and people of color is that it is a recognition, a promotion a realization, if you will, of a right to food and of a right to food sovereignty. Um, some of you may know that Maine was the first state in the nation to do both, to pass the Maine Food Sovereignty Act, which is the right of peoples to define their own agricultural food systems um, as a more as a right of the people, and then an individual right in our state constitution um, for a right to food. These are some of the quotes that have come from this report based on research and interviews. Wabanaki tribes hold roughly 1.06% of the land in Maine, whereas real estate investment trusts and timber investment management organizations own roughly 30% of Maine's forested land. Wealthy family owners who are non-corporate entities own roughly the same amount of land as the real estate investment trusts and the timber investment management organizations. Quote, native identified farmers hold just 0.9% of total farmlands in the state of Maine, according to a census from the, let's see, from NAS, which is the National Agricultural Statistics Service, 2017. This is a quote from United States Agricultural Secretary Tom Vilsack. The truth is the deck has been stacked against black farmers who for generations have been denied access to land and capital. From Adila Muhammad, the black community today in Maine comes from so many different places. There's no single cultural identity, so to speak, where we know how to relate to each other, where we have formed mutual trust and bonds that are articulated in a way that everyone understands. From Mali, on Boswin, natives have been forced off of few swaths of traditional land so that white farms could be established. By destroying dependable native food sources like planting grounds and salmon runs through river damming, we were starved out of our territories. 
The National Association of Realtors Research Group states that only 30% of Black and African American Mainers own homes, compared to 73% of white Mainers. From Olivia Moore, farming and agriculture have been tools of colonization. Agriculture has been a tool of genocide and occupation of our lands in a very limited way of viewing our food systems. In 2012, the Maine Indian Tribal State Commission issued a letter stating thus, the acts have created structural inequities that have resulted in conditions that have risen to the level of human rights violations. From John Banks, tribal folks need access to lands and resources to practice culture and traditions. It's what defines us as a tribal people, our relationship to the forest and the animals, our ancestors protected these lands and animals for thousands of years, and we need to continue practicing that. Enslavement is incompatible with land ownership. From Maya Williams, there are only 1.7% of Black people still in the state of Maine because there aren't enough Black people who deem it safe. Not enough has been done from Dr. Suzanne Greenlaw. A lot of native people say there is no separation between a human being and the landscape that we belong to. We are taught in our culture to see it, to witness it constantly. We see it as it is, a guide that holds instructions on how to live. From Dr. Anthony Sutton, water quality standards insist on levels that allow for the consumption of 200 grams of fish per day or seven ounces. That's a lot of meals, but people can only eat one to two meals a month looking at the current rates of contamination of the species. They should focus on making the standards a reality. This is under the topic, this is from a, let's see, National Law Center. Quote, these farmers alleged that they were being denied USDA farm loans or forced to wait longer for loan approval than were many non-minority farmers. Many black farmers contended that they were facing foreclosure and financial ruin because the USDA denied them timely loans and debt restructuring. Those are the quotes that are contained in the report. The summary of findings is pretty extensive. And then the recommendations I'll just read the three recommendations that are combined that would apply to both Black and African-American and Wabanaki people. They were simply additions of statutory definitions of agriculture and farming that are culturally relevant to Black or African-American and Wabanaki peoples. These definitions would facilitate inclusion and relevancy and could be used as guidelines for departmental grant and funding requirements to ensure that grant recipients do not face structural barriers based on monetary, experiential, or land ownership basis. Two, increasing land access for Black or African American and Wabanaki people, including culturally significant spaces, increase access to pre existing farms, agricultural areas, and critical coastal locations, historically the primary source of sustenance for tribal communities, specifically identified by content experts. And three, creation of Black or African-American and Wabanaki-specific Wabanaki grants and funding opportunities. This could be achieved at the state level through the Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry, which can be modeled off of current programs offered through the USDA. The creation of and funding allocation for set-asides for Black, African-American, and Indigenous farming and food-based projects that will aid in purchasing land, equipment, general operation costs, et cetera. Like I said, I was going to be brief today. Um, I want to say that what I've been working on, along with my colleagues in the department and the legislature for six terms, again, is more increased consumption of food in Maine based upon resilient community-based food systems. Right now, in front of the legislature, as a carryover, two carryover pieces of legislation that I'll be working with the department to see if we can come to some consensus would be to not only protect farmland, but also to ensure that we restore farmland to Black people through a Black Restoration Farmer Act. And we don't have all the details of that worked out yet, but it could be a part 
perhaps of a land for Maine's future infrastructure. We shall see. Another piece of legislation carried over is an act to protect and respect the right to food, which is a mini omnibus bill. It's not very long, but we've woven throughout it our places in statute where we currently have land access programs, land lease programs at the department, this department, also the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife Run, where we specifically put in language that basically says that the folks who are looking at these issues um, may consider giving priority to historically disinvested populations of people, as we are discussing here today, to make sure that we're lifting everyone up as we move Maine toward a more sustainable future where we are all fed and we can increase consumption of local foods. Ironically, just earlier today, I was on the New England, Feeding New England vision call, uh, which Commissioner Bill spoke of, 30 by 30. Um, that is what that is called, to see if New England can feed itself uh, more sustainably um, in the near future. 2030 is seven years away. Uh, and so we're almost there. We have a lot of work to do to get there. Um, Shelly asked me to finish with a poem about okra. Fortunately, I don't have a poem about okra to share. <laughs> and I'm not going to read a story about collard greens that I have read a thousand times um, in the six years because it's too long. But I, I, I am in the middle of putting up collard greens galore. And we're probably going to celebrate collard greens here on this land on this farm in the next few weeks um, because I can't get to them all. And maybe folks will come and pick their own and, and take what they can and leave a donation or not. I don't waste food. Um, but I was honored to be invited to write an essay about right to food and also uh, to put a recipe in the Maine Community Cookbook Volume 2. And so I put a recipe in for braised collards. And I will simply close with a narrative that introduces the recipe, uh, because there was a quote in the report that I just read about how we read nature, we read the leaves, we read food, it tells us how to live. And my parents, who were both members of the greatest generation, did exactly that um, with how they raised my sister and I. And so this is the narrative at the beginning of my recipe on braised collards. When Black people traveled north and west during the Great Migration, we carried our recipes with us. In the culinary lexicon of folks in this diaspora, your recipe for collard greens, how you cook collards, defines whether or not you can cook at all. Collards are on the menu at church suppers, potlucks, barbecues, picnics, and holiday feasts, no matter the season. Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's Eve, Easter, Memorial Day, Juneteenth, July 4th. Collards have their own special place in soul food traditions. Every year, for as long as I can remember, my father grew the greenest, sweetest collards in our backyard garden in Milwaukee. My mother, who swore the greens, could tell you everything you needed to know about how the world was doing, would read the broad leaves as she meticulously washed them and then turn the collars into heaven on a plate. Now, collars grow like perennial weeds all over my 25 acre farm here in Winthrop. They overwinter, flower in late spring and self-propagate for harvesting through Christmas with climate change. I read the leaves in the field. They tell me when to harvest each one of them, usually in the rain, for I let the rainwater wash them thereafter. I swear it makes them cook more tenderly and I never remove the stems. Collards are high in fiber, vitamin K, C, and A, calcium, folate, and rich in antioxidants. Collards are commonly served as a side dish with southern fried chicken, fish, or smoked spare ribs as the main. I love collards so much, I often eat them as the main course, accompanied by a piece of warm cornbread, slices of fresh summer vegetables, and spoons of green tomato chow chow on the side. So I'll end with that prayer for collard greens and food. And uh, thank you so much for allowing me to participate in, in today's discussion. Thank you so much, Senator Hickman. And I definitely wanna hear the poem on okra at some point. Um, we might need a round two. And I did put in the chat just for folks, uh, the land access for indigenous and African-American farmers in Maine report. So please check that out.
And I'd like to introduce our last speaker here, and then we'll get into some Q&A. So feel free to keep putting questions in the Q&A function, and we'll get to as many as we can. Chelsea Gazillo is American Farmland Trust New England Policy Manager and Director of their Working Lands, oh, and Director of the Working Lands Alliance in Connecticut. In these roles, she is responsible for conducting research, providing education to stakeholders, policy development and analysis, and outreach. She also works in collaboration with other policy leaders and farmers in the region to develop and advance policies that will promote farmland protection and access. Further to the implementation of climate smart agricultural practices and ensure farmers have the resources they need to remain economically viable. In this work, she is committed to uplifting and centering voices of historically marginalized communities in the creation, development, and advancement of resilient agricultural policies. Take it away, Chelsea. Thank you, Matt. Right, I'm going to try to figure out how to share my screen here. All right. Uh, well, that was, that was great. Um, you are all wonderful presenters and I feel a little intimidated to bring us home, but I'm going to do my best here. Uh, so, as Matt mentioned, my name is Chelsea Gazillo, and I'm the New England Policy Manager for American Farmland Trust. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with American Farmland Trust, we are a national organization that works from farmers' kitchen tables to the halls of Congress to advance farmland protection, promote sound farming practices, and keep farmers on the land. As my fellow panelists have mentioned, Maine's farmland plays a vital role in the state's goals to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And for the state's farmland to be an essential component of these climate efforts, advancing farmland protection and access will be critical. We know that well-managed farmland has more potential to sequester greenhouse gas emissions than farmland converted to non-farm uses. As American Farmland Trust mentioned in our Farms Under Threat 2040 report, Choosing an abundant future, farmland protection, compact development, and smart growth are key climate change adaptation strategies. So I've been asked to present on how Maine compares to other New England states in terms of farmland protection and what federal programs are currently available to support uh, these efforts. I want to highlight some of the conservation sector's farmland or farm bill recommendations to increase uh, farmland protection efforts throughout the country and including Maine. All right, so I want to start by thanking Shelley for grounding us and providing a broad overview as to how farmland protection and access are connected to climate action in Maine. And I would also like to thank the commissioner and Senator Hickman for also uh, grounding us in this, grounding us for this webinar. Uh, Maine's farmland base is essential to our region's economy and food security. According to AFT's 2020 Farms Under Threat and New England Perspective, between 2001 to 2016, over 105,000 acres of agricultural land were lost or threatened by development pressures. And at the same time, since the region's purchase of agricultural conservation or PACE uh, programs have invested nearly a half million dollars in farmland protection efforts. As other speakers have mentioned, Maine alone has invested 12.5 million since 1987. In comparison, Massachusetts has invested over 245 million uh, and New Hampshire has invested over 20 million in state efforts to protect farmland. Many of the state's region, many of the region region's PACE programs were established over 40 years ago. Um, and if you ask Massachusetts and Connecticut, they're at war as to which one uh, started first. I actually took a land use planning class with a professor um, at UMass and he claims that Massachusetts PACE program was the first, but I, I, I believe it is Connecticut, but I did get that um, question wrong on, on one of the exams he gave. 
So several New England states have, because of this, several New England states have configured new ways to advance farmland protection efforts. Uh, three New England states that Shelley mentioned earlier, Vermont, Massachusetts, and Connecticut, have developed steady funding sources for farmland protection. There are conveyance fee tax dedicated to funding farmland protection efforts. I'm going to highlight one here. So Connecticut's Community Investment Act passed in 2005 created a $50 fee placed on every real estate transaction that is subsequently split through a pre-calculated formula between affordable housing, open space preservation, historic preservation, sustainable funding for the dairy sector, and farmland protection. This generally generates nearly $5 million annually in Connecticut's farmland protection efforts. Recognizing that partners have a role in accelerating and supporting New Hampshire's efforts to preserve farmland, the New Hampshire Department of Ag worked with New Hampshire Food System Alliance and other advocates during the 2023 legislative session to update the agency's Agricultural Land Preservation or ALP program statute to allow land trusts, nonprofits, and other entities to support the agency by conducting stewardship and monitoring of easements. Massachusetts recently acknowledged that while the state has protected a lot of farmland since the program, since the Agricultural Preservation Restriction Program inception, a strategic plan that intends to address the farmland needs and goals of the Commonwealth will be imperative to improving farmland protection and access efforts. The plan is yet to be released, but should be out soon. Uh, lastly, one tool that was developed and tested here in Maine, known as Buy, Protect, Sell, where an entity will buy land, work with partners to protect it, and then sell it at a discounted rate to a, to a farmer is being used by states like Rhode Island to increase affordable farmland opportunities for farmers while simultaneously protecting farmland from development. Outside the region, states like Washington have set up a state buy protect sell financing program called the Farm Protection and Affordability Investment Revolving Loan Program. So, of course, a key component of farmland protection, as many have mentioned, is ensuring that the farmland we protect remains in agricultural production and continues contributing to our rural economies and regions food security efforts. New England has some of the most expensive farmland in the country. States are looking at how to, how to pair farmland protection efforts with farmland access tools. A widely used tool is the option to purchase at agricultural value, also known as OPAV. OPAV puts an additional legal restriction on a farm property protected with an agricultural easement that says it must stay in agricultural production. When the land is sold, it must be sold to a qualified farmer or to a family member. Maine Farmland Trust is currently using this tool and DACF holds one OPAV. Both Massachusetts and Vermont are also implementing the OPAV tool. Outside the region, Delaware's Young Farmer Loan Program offers a 30-year no interest loan to help young farmers purchase farmland. One of the obstacles, one of the main obstacles to uh, starting out in the business. The loan is for up to 70% of the appraised value of the farm's development rights, not exceeding a uh, half million dollars. Farms in the program are placed, are then placed into a permanent preservation easement. Lastly, and I'm really glad that Senator Hickman and Shelley um, mentioned this, looking at alternative opportunities for farmers will be critical. Alternative land opportunities for farmers, only some farmers want to own farmland. State leasing programs like Massachusetts and Connecticut, alternative easement arrangements like cultural respect easements will be essential as states continue to increase farmland protection efforts. So states are looking at how to improve PACE programs to make them more accessible to historically marginalized producers uh, and small farms. In addition to the report that Senator Hickman mentioned earlier, I want to highlight two efforts that are happening in the region, one from Connecticut and one from Vermont. The Connecticut Department of Agriculture recently commissioned a diversity, equity, and inclusion report. The report includes recommendations as to how to increase land access opportunities for the state's historically marginalized producers. One of the recommendations is to create a down payment assistance program for BIPOC farmers to acquire land, including urban farmland. The report was also uh, released in Spanish. 
The second example I want to uplift here is the Vermont Land Access and Opportunity Act. The efforts to create the Land Access and Opportunity Board, or LAOB, were led by a coalition called Seeding Power, which is a multiracial coalition dedicated to increasing farm, homeownership, and farmland access for Vermont's BIPOC community. All right, so now that I've gone over how state, states can work to improve pace uh, programs and increase farmland access opportunities, I want to highlight how increasing funding for and improving state PACE programs can leverage more federal funding. This year is also a farm bill year, which means organizations like AFT, MFT, and Sierra Club are all working on opportunities to improve some of the key, some of the key federal programs I'll mention. The United States Department of Agricultural's Natural Conservation Services Agricultural Conservation Easement Program offers funding for farmland protection through the Agricultural Land Easement Program. This is known as ASEP Ale. Improving and updating this critical program is currently on the table as part of the 2023 Farm Bill debates. Before I dive into what we would love to see uh, improved with ASEP Bail, I wanted to just give a quick 2023 Farm Bill update. So at the moment, both congressional chambers are working on draft language. In the Senate, staff have been developing language together. And for most of the conservation programs that AFT, MFT, and others have been pushing, Language has been reviewed by USDA. It has been made clear by House Republicans that this farm bill will not have any new spending allocated within it. When the Inflation Reduction Act passed last summer, Congress allocated nearly 20 billion to key conservation programs, including the ASAP bail program. Congress is now concerned that USDA will not be able to spend that money, and there has been debate about folding this 20 billion into the farm bill. The ASAP ale program has been critical to protecting farmland, but it is, but there are opportunities to streamline and expedite it. Right now, the average closing time for an ag conservation easement is nearly two years. And for farmers that want to uh, sell their land or their, we always say farmers are land rich and cash poor, and they're um, oftentimes their retirement plans are tied up in land. And so this two years can, can seem like forever if you're trying to get out of the get out of the business or figure out how to pass on your farm to the next generation. Uh, working with land trust partners across the country, AFT is advocating for the following changes to the ASAP Ale program to help expedite this process. We'd like to see increasing increasing funding for the program, creating more options for federal cost share, enhancing the entity certification process and benefits. Reduce, reducing the administrative burden of the program on USDA and RCS, improving ASAP ALE's buy, protect, sell provision so that the program can be even greater, can be an even greater tool for providing land access opportunities for new and beginning uh, and BIPOC producers, strengthening the Farmland Protection Act and ensuring it covers new federal investments in renewable energy. The second area I wanna highlight in the Farm Bill is land access and farm viability. Since the last Farm Bill and in the last couple of years, significant new programs have been set up to address these. Courtesy of the American Rescue Plan Act or ARPA, the first ever USDA land access program at FSA was established. This program offers down payment funds and technical assistance to increase land access opportunities. Uh, we have the regional food business center centers being set up by USDA Agricultural Market Services or AMS, including one uh, that will be run by NIASDA that covering from Pennsylvania to Connecticut, which will help to provide farm and food entrepreneurs with the business technical assistance and capital they need to run successful operations. The Farm Bill is a chance to codify these programs so that all of the work in standing them up is not lost at the end of their one-time funding. In addition, AFT and many other advocates support the creation of an Office of Small Farms at USDA. We've seen numerous instances where USDA programs have just not worked well for small farms because of their size, including in Maine. We wanna thank Congresswoman Pingree for uh, co-sponsoring the Office of Small Farms Establishment Act, which creates an office in USDA's Farm Production and Conservation Business Center. 
uh, to specifically support agency staff in better serving small farms. To close us out, all of the provisions I mentioned are connected to supporting efforts to increase farmland protection in Maine and throughout the region. Our nation's farmers, ranchers, and foresters are essential allies in reaching the 30 by 30 goals for biodiversity conservation and climate mitigation. The lands they manage are crucial for wildlife habit, habitat, carbon sequestration, food security, clean water, and rural prosperity. Um, I'm happy to put any of the links I mentioned in the chat. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me or my colleague, Eliza Patterson, our new New England policy associate. Uh, try to... Well, thank you, Matt. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you so much, Chelsea. Um, a lot of information. This is this was amazing. Probably going to need uh, a lot more time to dive into specifics, but hopefully that's what the working group through the Climate Council can kind of serve as for folks who want to follow along. Um, but we'll do our best in the last 15 minutes to get to uh, questions that I see some of you have. So maybe just to start um, with the commissioner, and then these questions are open to all of our panelists, so feel free. But there was a first question on LMF and the statistics. So I don't know if you can see that for actual um, budget allocations. And then um, maybe we can get into some PFAS stuff after that. Yeah, uh, thanks for thanks for asking this question. It looks like a clarification of the one point six million dollars that I mentioned. That is one point six million that has been uh, committed so far to farmland protection projects. That is not the the maximum amount that will be uh, hopefully committed to farmland protection programs. Um, but we release requests for proposals uh, periodically, and uh, and we you know evaluate what we get, but. We're um, also hoping that the the improvements to the working farmland and uh, protection program will make it uh, so that more projects will come forth. Um, and I think that that's you know that's very likely to happen. Uh, in the meantime, I, I did just take a quick look back, and I think um, originally the LMF board had allocated something like four million dollars to farmland protection projects. Um, that was just initially and. Uh, so if we start pushing up against that amount, uh, the LMF board can have more con conversation about that. Great. Thank you for that. And then maybe do you want to start us off on uh, talking about PFAS? I know that's obviously a huge concern over the last few years in particular. Um, sure. how, how does PFAS plan to purchasing of lands and um, the LMF program in particular? Yeah, so for those who uh, uh, are not uh, familiar with PFAS and uh, the discovery that we've been making over the past uh, few years around um, impacts to farmland, uh, this is something that I, I say, what what is it now, like four years and X number of months ago before I took this position, I had never heard of PFAS. So it's been uh, a really uh, quick learning process. And um, we're now working with um, a number of farms that have been identified through various means, mostly through uh, our Department of Environmental Protection, going back through uh, records of um, permits to spread biosolids on agricultural lands and testing those lands um, systematically for any traces or um, for impacts of PFAS. And so, um, at this point in time, I, I would say, you know, DEP has made it through their first two tiers of testing, and those were the lands that were expected to be most likely impacted. Um, and as they are continuing to move forward, I, I think the my my assumption, and I'm only going to say this is my assumption, is that um, there will be less likely uh, uh it'll be less likely that they'll be finding significantly more farms as they move through the, the remainder of these levels of tiers of testing. And so I feel like we've got generally a pretty good handle on the amount of PFAS contamination in the state, not, not completely, not 100%, but I think we have a sense of how widespread it will be. The vast majority of farms in the state will not be impacted by PFAS. 
And I think that's really important for people to understand um, where there are farms that are impacted, we are identifying those farms and we are putting a lot of resources and time behind helping those farmers. And, uh, and also just to say that impact can really happen on a spectrum. And just because a farm shows that it's been impacted by PFAS, it doesn't mean the entire farm is impacted. It doesn't mean that they can't find a way forward. And, and we're very invested in helping them with that as well. Um, so all of that is to say that, you know, this is something we're working on really diligently. Um, farms that are impacted to the degree where farmers cannot uh, foresee going forward and operating a viable um, farm business on that land. Um, we're actually just in the process of uh, rulemaking for a $60 million PFAS fund that the legislature and the governor authorized. Um, and we are going to be standing up some programs that will have a lot of different uh, mechanisms for helping these farmers. And one of those mechanisms is a buyback program where we will be able to buy their farm uh, or portions of their farm from them so that they are not saddled with the burden of that land. Um, those lands would not end up in the LMF program. Uh, they would be held by the state, by the Department of Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry. And as time goes forward um, and as more research is underway, which is something that the PFAS fund can also pay for, um, we are hopeful that we will learn more about how to mitigate the, the impact and mitigate the pollution. Um, as I said before, our, our best farmland soils are a finite resource and we are very committed to trying to make sure that we um, protect those, those soils and also help our farmers who have been impacted by this really tragic situation. Great, yeah, Shelly, do you wanna add anything? Sure. Thank you, Commissioner Beal, for that comprehensive response. And thanks, Matt. Um, I just wanted to add that for Maine Farmland Trust and the agricultural easements that we do throughout the state, if a property is showing up on that map of permitted sludge spreading sites, which to be clear, doesn't necessarily mean that sludge spreading took place there and there necessarily is contamination, but something that we do as a land trust is, is screen those properties for PFAS before we make that land you know, forever available for agriculture. So that relates to your question, thankful about sort of screening for PFAS and how that's being done and also to the commissioner's answer. And then the other thing that I wanted to just sort of highlight and put a plug in for is the fact that at this point, there's no scientific um, method for removing PFAS from the soil. So in terms of uh, remediation, that research is really in its infancy. And so I think I just wanna put a plug in for how important it is for the $60 million fund for other research, um, funding mechanisms and efforts to really commit in a long-term way to figuring out how we remove PFAS from the soil. That will be important in Maine moving, and it will also be important in many other countries around, I mean, in many other states around the country, because we know that the situation of PFAS contamination is, is not unique to Maine. It's just that Maine is at the forefront of developing policy responses and solutions to this contamination problem. Um, so I was glad that you asked that, thankful, because uh, the remediation research is, is really needs to be ongoing. And the more that we invest in it now, the more we can move towards cleaning our soil and not losing any of Maine's agricultural land. And my uncle used to have a phrase that said the solution presents itself before the problem. And the research has not yet confirmed this, but I do believe that there are a number of crops that will take up all sorts of contaminants from the soil, um, not the least of which is hemp. So I can't say that that's gonna be the solution, but I do know that we probably have a solution out there that we just haven't found yet. Could I, could I just add that um, this has been, you know, clearly a really difficult and challenging topic for us at the Department of Agriculture. And I just wanna say how much we've appreciated working with a number of entities in Maine. Our, our response to PFAS, you know, we do have some resources in the department, but um, we we couldn't do everything we've been doing without the partnership of Maine Farmland Trust, of, of MOFCA, of Cooperative Extension, 
and numerous others uh, who have really uh, stepped forward and helped us to, to work through this, this situation. So I think it's a real, it shines a light on the strength that, that, we, uh, that we have when we work together. And, uh, and I'm just really grateful for that here in Maine. Yeah, thank you all. Um, and maybe because we're on PFAS, one more quick question I see about um, kind of percentage and testing on lands. Do you, do you see that question, Commissioner? Is that possible to answer? Or what percentage of farms with a history of spreading um, did not test with the state? I don't have that uh, information, but my gut sense is it's uh, it would be a very small number. Um, what we do have are also farmers that have not waited for the tiered testing process to get to them, and they've been concerned about their own families and their own health and the, the health of their community. And um, they have actually elected to uh, get private testing and then have come forth and asked for help from the Department of Agriculture and some of the other organizations that I've mentioned. So that would be my best answer at this point. Okay, great. Um, I know we only have a few minutes left here, so I think we can get to a land use related question. Um, and then we'll make sure there's a couple minutes at the end for all of our panelists just to give their final one minute thoughts. So, um, Let's try to get to this one. I think this is probably for everyone, but maybe if you want to start, Commissioner, um, I mean, you mentioned land use earlier and kind of the general charge. That's kind of some of the work uh, I and Sierra Club are interested in is that intersection of farmland and planning and transit. Um, I think this kind of gets to the land use question in the chat about subdevelopments and preventing sprawl. So. Um, I don't know if are, you want to start and then if folks have general reactions to how might we work through uh, preventing sprawl and specifically around subdivisions and land use planning. Big question, but any part of that if you'd like to take. Yeah, I'm not I'm not landing quickly on the question in the Q&A on. OK, it was specifically about. Um, Right now, we have a lot of one and two acre residential lots. Um, and a lot of that is, you know, uh, increasing the amount of sprawl and um, maybe preventing farmland protection. So there was a bill mentioned, LD 1787, that would allow towns to reset zoning, and require a vote of municipal officials. Um, feel free to talk about that bill in particular or and or kind of generally how we can approach land use planning and zoning to um, prevent spawn and protect more farmland. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, that particular piece of legislation, I do not have cataloged in my brain right now. Um, just to give you some context, the last legislative session, uh, we had a record number of bills pertaining to our department. <laughs> and uh, so it's a little bit of a blur, but um, what I can say is that, you know, and this goes back to my time when I was at Maine Farmland Trust. And so I think this will probably resonate with Shelley and with Chelsea. Um, but, you know, part of the part of the puzzle here is that, as I said, there's development pressure everywhere throughout the state and in different it comes in different forms. Um, and so we need to recognize that and we need to be looking at how we can best support farms to be viable. Um, and that is, you know, we want to protect farmland, yes, but farmland becomes vulnerable when a farmer is not able to make a living um, because there are market forces at play or there are other you know, challenges that come their way unexpectedly. And uh, those are all the kinds of things that I know Shelley can speak to really intimately from the work that MFT does on the ground in Maine. Uh, and that's also the kind of thing that we've been looking at where we want to understand what farms need. We've done some surveys about what farms need to be more um, resilient and viable. Uh, we've, you know, we did a heritage industry survey. That was really the genesis behind us taking uh, $20 million of, of ARPA funding 
and creating an agricultural investment or infrastructure investment program in our state where we gave out 64 grants to farmers and food processors, uh, really trying to get at some of the bottlenecks that were you know, holding farms back, not being able to get processing for meat or other products. Uh, so that's, you know, that's something, and it's something we're going to continue to work on. Uh, we actually have some funding that will be coming to us from the USDA through their Resilient Food Systems Initiative program. Uh, and we're going to be able to make some more of those investments and uh, really help farmers to work through what their infrastructure needs are so that they can, you know, be vibrant, vital businesses that we need them to be in our state. Um, so that's, that's just one piece of the puzzle, but I'm sure Shelly could add a lot more to that. I think that's a really important piece of the puzzle. I agree. One of the things that I'll add and, and maybe just close with, because I know we're running short on, we want to close this, Matt, but it's just to say that there, there's so much important work going on across the state that relates to farmland protection. Uh, so we talked about some strategies in this webinar, but there's, there's much more that could be covered. Um, so definitely need for further conversation and exploration including continuing to look at sort of those access links. Um, I did want to mention that we will be following up with participants after this webinar to share some links. Um, and we can share a link to some of Grow Smart's wonderful resources on smart growth um, as something that really relates to the question that was asked. Um, we also, for MFT, we have uh, Cultivating Maine's Agricultural Future, a policy and planning guide for Maine towns. That is a publication that we will be sharing the second edition of next month. We've been partnering on that with the Department of Ag Conservation and Forestry, and it goes through a full range of strategies that towns can take to support farmers and protect farmland. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Um, and I also just wanted to put a plug in that there's there's a lot more to say, but we will. We promise to share out a bunch of links to relevant resources and just thank you all for participating and joining this important discussion. Thanks, Shelly. And thanks for the segue um, just to kind of wrap up. So, yeah, I'd call on Senator Hickman for your response and then any other kind of final thoughts, actions you want folks to be aware of. I just wanted to respond directly to Carl Wilma's question. Um, 1787 is a bill that's been carried over and it probably can't predict, won't go anywhere because the growth management law is being completely reworked in the Housing Commission. The, the Joint Select Committee on Housing, I chaired two commissions and the growth management laws are very important to our land use across the state. And the Bureau of Information and Technology, which is under the Department of Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry, has a wonderful director who's working on these issues uh, in, in, in a very robust way. And the last thing that I wanted to say is that as we talk about farmland protection, you know, the Wabanaki people and even indigenous African-American people who are descendants of a lot of African tribes, when we looked at land as communal, we have publicly owned lands, we have state owned lands, we have municipally owned lands. And one of the features of the legislation I referred to earlier that I have carried over is to envision looking at making sure that we are producing food for our communities in common spaces. And so we really do need to look at how all of our lands that we own as a people that will not necessarily be uh, development pressure on can also be used uh, to grow food to keep Maine a sustainably food producing state. Those are my last thoughts. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, if there's time, I don't know if Chelsea, you want to go and then we'll end with Commissioner Biel. Just a quick uh, wrap up final thoughts. Yeah, thank you all for uh, joining us for this webinar today. And thank you to Commissioner Beal and Senator Hickman for agreeing to be speakers. Uh, panelists with Shelly and Matt and I. Uh, this has really been very informative for me and I've appreciated the conversation deeply. And I guess I would just leave with um, that it's apparent we have to continue to work in fierce cooperation, uh, stealing the, the, the term from a Connecticut farmer that just won the Leopold Conservation Award, Terry Jones of Jones Family Farm. Um, to advance farmland protection, not only in Maine, but in the region. And I look forward uh, to doing that with you all in the future, in the near future, hopefully.
Great. Thanks, Chelsea. And Commissioner Beal, any final thoughts? I would just say thank you so much for making the space for this conversation to happen. Matt, thank you for your great facilitation and everybody on this call, uh, panelists and folks that are tuning in alike who are are interested in this topic. And again, I would just invite you uh, to stay tuned with the Natural and Working Lands Working Group. Uh, you can you can find our information uh, for the Maine Climate Council on the website for GOPIF, the Governor's Office of Innovation Policy in the Future. They uh, will post our meeting times and dates and any materials. And, uh, and if you have any trouble finding that, please reach out to me and I'd be happy to connect you. Great. Thank you so much again to all of our panelists, especially Senator Hickman and Commissioner Beal. Thank you all for being here. Uh, we'll follow up and stay tuned. Have a great rest of your day.